Hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the Fight for Together podcast. It's been a really long time. It has, actually. And we are broadcasting, recorded, not live, from our new studio space and our new chairs that yeah. I don't think the Fight for Together podcast has seen yet. Wow. Yeah. Lots changed. You're listening to the Fight for Together podcast. All right. We have an exciting topic for you guys. A lot's happened um, since the last time we have recorded, <clears throat> but yeah. welcome. If you're new to the podcast, uh, my name is Ben. And I'm Cammy. And this is an extension of our YouTube channel where we like to spend a little bit of extra time and get into some topics that require a little bit more conversation a little bit slower pace um and obviously we've been in the middle of this pandemic and if you've been following our youtube channel you know that um one of the things our family did was we revamped our entire schedule um that was based on living a life out of purpose and not based on panic and i wrote a book about this actually it's kind of weird because the book is about the process that I used to write the book. <laughs> um, yeah. It's like, what is that like? It's like the never ending story. Oh, yeah. Wow. And there, yeah, you're within the narrative itself. Wow. Whoa. <laughs> Crazy. Wrap your mind around that. The book is called Unleash Your Family Chaos to Creativity in One Week. And the next podcast that we're going to be discussing are basically concepts from the book. So if you've read the book, that should be familiar to you. If you haven't, you'll find this stuff there, but we're going to go more in depth. And you can get this book where? Oh, Cammy, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> On Amazon, or as our neighbors around here say, Amazon.com. <laughs> <laughs> in case you're confused. Yeah. Um, so... Yes, the book is available. Well, I'll get onto all that afterwards. If you find the topic interesting enough and you want to read more, then you at least will have that resource. So today's topic is alternatives to addictions, but specifically for kids. Um, and I use that term addiction very loosely. Or lightly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of people, they mean it to be a bad thing. and Or it's like... You think of drugs. It's or... like a four-letter word. Yeah. It's like you're addicted. Mm -hmm. And although that might be the case, you know, do I need to, I want to turn on this light, actually. It's, you're going to have to, yeah. Uh, I don't know if that helps at all. Um, but I'm referring, when I say addiction, I'm referring to any habit specifically that you see as a parent that you think is not helpful for your children. And or it's getting in the way of something that's better, yeah. perhaps. And maybe it has a strong draw and kind of a looping type phenomenon where it's like Groundhog's Day, where it's like the same thing over and over and over without any sign of letting up. So in our family, I'll share some of the things that we see our children doing a lot that fit these criteria are getting on the computer uh to watch movies or whatever so netflix is like a site that is actually yeah. when we say netflix i kind of mean any form of visual entertainment I, which yeah. could be youtube or right could be a lot of things uh, disney plus it doesn't matter or the kids that have phones three of our kids have phones just staring at their phone or texting or Scrolling Instagram. The phone is a gateway to many um, kind of worlds. And maybe the other big one I'll say is video games. Yeah, which I guess I don't feel like we have that as bad as much of a... I was going to say the word bad. Uh, I don't feel like that's as much of an issue for us, although it has been in the past. And I do think that Rain if Rainier was left to him, like he would play him every single day. He loves, he loves 
He's so funny. He's only four, but he loves like getting on there and playing those games. Um, and one other, so, so these are kind of like, I guess I'll call them problems in parenting world because they're one of the major sources of stress and tension in our marriage and family historically. Mm -hmm. And what I hear in a lot of people is they feel like their kids do too much of this, these types of activities and they're constantly frustrated, feeling like their kids brains are rotting. They're not actualizing their full potential. Mm-hmm. And I'll I'll toss a another one in there that I think kind of goes in the same category, at least for the conversation today, and that is boredom. Mm. So, you know, although we don't see boredom in the same category that we see video games and surfing the internet and movies, sometimes it has the same effect where the kids, they sit around, they say they're bored, and they're constantly bored. And as parents, I feel like, well why don't you go and do something productive is how I feel and what I think. But that's like really hard. I mean, there's, I I feel like there's moments or days that it's easy for me to not be bored. And then there's moments or days where it's really difficult to motivate. It's not so much that I guess as an adult, I'm not so much bored. I'm just not motivated. And for a kid, that could be actually what they're saying is like, I'm not motivated to do something that would make me not bored, (laughs) you know, unless it's like the easy stuff, which is we already mentioned. Yeah. And I think really this entire thing is hard. Yeah. Because you talk about loops and I feel like for me, I'll get... In, I'll get stuck um, often there'll just be moments or days where I just I'm like I just do not feel like doing anything um, even though I have shit to do um, but it's like really hard to to just stay focused or motivated or whatever um, and for kids it's a little different. They have that issue too. But then sometimes like, especially the younger kids, they don't have a lot of shit to do, but they have to actually focus or be motivated to not be bored. They have to figure that out. And that sometimes that's hard. You're just like, I don't, I don't want to. (laughs) You know, what's funny too is who really has shit to do. Mm. I mean, we say that we do as adults, but most of it's fictional pressure we put on ourselves. It's, that kids don't even okay they, i mean i i I agree with you i'm just kind of like well it's or here. it's pressure other people put on us exactly. that we allow yes to but, get it's, to but us a lot of or... it it's not like we actually need to do these things or we'll die and kids yeah. just don't have that pressure so literally they wake up and they're like i get to watch tv all day and that's i think the appeal to having a nine to five job i'm guessing is you don't have a choice. Like you have to show well, up. Well, once again, well, you do it doesn't choice. feel like you have a choice. Have, well, I'm just saying like, but even that feeling is, it can be helpful even though. Oh, yeah. Because there'll be days that you're just like, oh, you know, and I would not have gone through 12 years of school if, you know, it was, if it, I hadn't felt like I had to show up. Yeah. That's how they, that's how they get you. Right. They scare you. And they're like, if you don't show up, something really, really bad will happen. And you're like, what? And you're like, it's so bad. We can't even say, but actually it doesn't exist. Someone would be very <laughs> unhappy with you. Um, okay. So I want to talk about our typical responses to our children's vegging out addictions and boredom historically. And I would also call these things our natural responses now. Um, In the past, when our kids aren't doing, actualizing their potential and they're filling their minds with what feels like useless shit, um, there is a tendency to just want to create more restrictions around the thing, to basically blame the video games, Mm -hmm. to blame the internet, to blame the phone, or to blame the kid and say, oh, you're lazy or whatever. Yeah. When I don't, yeah. Now, 
there's a couple problems with this that I've noticed um, from a wide range of sources. The first source is actually my own addiction um, process. Of, I've spent eight years in 12-step groups working through conversations about addictions and my own story. And second of all, I want to talk about something I learned from a Montessori teacher um, while we were hiking the Appalachian Trail. <clears throat> so we were in what state would that be? Hmm. Hmm. Maybe Massachusetts. Maybe. And I watched this lady. Her name was Melissa. My Lisa. My Lisa. And she also went by the name Jaguar Pa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we stayed at her house and she interacted with Rainier in this way where my jaw dropped to the floor. I was like, to a point where I like I watched her in the kitchen with him mm-hmm. and I couldn't figure out what the heck she was doing. But I I was so intrigued that I asked her and I said, why do you talk to him this way? Mm-hmm. And I can't even really explain it except for it'll be clear in a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I was so intrigued and she said, I learned this from my years as a Montessori teacher. Mm-hmm. And what she was doing, as she explained, was Rainier was two, and he was asking for everything. He's like, can I have pop? Can I help you? Can I carry this? Can I do this? Can I do that? Which can be a very overwhelming experience when you're trying to get something done. Mm -hmm. And she was trying to get something done. She was cooking for these eight guests in her house. Mm -hmm. Um, Actually, Hops was there, so it was nine guests. Uh. And instead of saying no, she says... She, she said, yes. And she said, you can help me by holding this bowl. And then she'd give him a bowl to hold or something like that. And it was so weird because he was totally happy. She was totally happy. And she never said no to him. And when she explained why, it didn't have to do with a moral thing. Mm-hmm. But what she said was, when you say no to a kid especially when they're at certain stages of development, the only thing they hear is whatever the last thing you say is. So if you say, don't talk, what a kid hears you say is, talk. <laughs> that's that's the last word that came out of your mouth, and it's the mm-hmm. most psychologically imprinting, not the no. <clears throat> so if you say, like, don't play video games, what kids will remember is video, video games. games. Yeah. And she, so what she was doing was redirecting positive energy instead of just focusing all this thing on getting him to stop or get him out of the kitchen, which is what I think we were doing. Mm -hmm. She was directing his interest and energy towards something positive by saying, hold this bowl. And she, she said the funniest thing. (laughs) She said, this even works with adults too. Mm -hmm. So she gave me this example of how people come over to her house to, to do this party thing and how people always ask her, can I help you in the kitchen? Yeah. And as a host, I always respond as like, no, we got it. Thanks. Right. But what she said, the way she responds is to say, yes, you can keep me company in the kitchen while I cook. <laughs> and I was like, holy crap. That is so brilliant. Mm-hmm. Because... It's a win-win. Everyone wants to feel useful. Yeah. Because you maybe need to get stuff done, but this is allows you to still get that stuff done, but you're also including someone else with what they want. And as a host, a lot of times it's not easier to give dole out jobs to people. They don't know your kitchen. They don't know where yeah. your stuff is and how you like things done. So yeah. But to say, yes, you can help me by keeping me company. Yeah. Now all of a sudden the person feels valued and like they're yeah. a part of the process and like they're contributing. Yeah. I feel like I've had people say that to me when they're, you can come, you can come on in here and let's talk or whatever, however they say it. So the point of this is to just say that suppression, and this is another principle I write about in this book, um, what you... What's the phrase? What you, uh, dang it, I can't uh, remember it. 
Mm, what, what you yeah it's like what you look what you <laughs> avoid <laughs> i totally know what it you're would be to so say. nice if i could remember this right about now i know but it's like what you repress basically becomes the most powerful thing mm-hmm. um and the proof that i provide persists you know what? yes what you resist persists yeah thank you cammy <laughs> what you resist persists and i think this is true personally and i think it's also true of the people around us so if we try and resist their video games it will just persist even more Mm -hmm. now the psychological proof i have for this um montessori principle is if i say everyone right now i want you guys all to not think about a pink elephant what are you thinking about (laughs) It's I like, go, duh, okay. the second I mention something, you can't take it out of your mind. Mm. So <clears throat> the premise that I want to lay out here that I would just say has helped me is to say that kids are doing the activities that are most interesting and available to them. Mm-hmm. That's like just kind and, of a law. And that are the easiest too. Which maybe that's another way of saying what's available, but sometimes you don't want to do the hard stuff, and so you just do the easy stuff. So you'll do, if you want to know what a child is interested in, look at what's available and what they do. And the reason why I'm saying this is I think a lot of times as parents, I don't want to believe that truth about my child or myself for that matter. Yeah. I want to just say, oh, I want to blame the video games. Well, because we've also attached a moral judgment to it. And we see it as, oh, if you're not working hard or if you're not productive, then there's something wrong with you. But there's a couple, I mean, to dig into this a little bit, there's two words I want to focus on, interesting and available. Um, one is, if we all know this when it comes to like buying food we eat what's available. So shopping is really important when it comes to your diet. If you stock your freezer full of ice cream. (laughs) Guess what happens at 10 p.m. (laughs) at night? Uh... It's going to be really hard to eat healthy. Yeah. Regardless of how good your intention is. Yeah. But if your freezer is full of tofu burgers and nuts at 10 p.m. and there's no ice cream. Then I go get. (laughs) <laughs> non tofu burgers. <laughs> uh, that's a terrible example. But uh, if your yeah, if your freezer is full of healthy snacks, you yeah. will eat healthier. Yeah. Okay. Now, also in terms of the interest, I think if we just take these facts and, like Cami said, not put a moral judgment on it and just say people do what interests them, and. A lot of people, if we give, we have to give ourselves, I think, more credit. I think people in general are more interested than entertainment and addictions and Mm -hmm. video games and Netflix. But I think a lot of times we don't have the energy to use the imagination to come up with ideas. Mm -hmm. So we just go to what's easier. But it doesn't mean we're not interested. It just means, well, we definitely are interested in in what's easiest. A lot of roadblocks emotionally and sometimes physically for people um to be able to do the thing you know the things that i don't know i just think of like let's say someone is interested in drawing but they've thought their whole life well i'm not a drawer or i'm not good at drawing or i remember when my friend Susan and I drew together. She was way better than me. So why even bother? You know, that's just like an example of probably what happens like with a lot of things. There's just these roadblocks that get in the way of us being able to pursue anything other than entertainment. And if this is true for parents or adults, imagine... If it's challenging for adults, imagine how challenging it is for kids. 
Yes, but I would say in some respects it's less because they have less years of playing those same tapes. I'm not a good drawer. I'm not a good drawer. Um, the flip side I would say is parents, adults have a have a wider range of view of successes and options. Yeah. I mean, I know what I can buy on Amazon. I know what That's courses true. are available at a community college. I know like where to go get resources and buy things and I can just hop in my car. Mm -hmm. Kids, they literally wake up and they look at like what's in front of them, mm -hmm. you know? And if there's a TV with a video game console hooked up to it, yeah, they will see that I and think, they'll think this is my day. I think of, uh, we just got a kitten and obviously kittens are different than children, but I do see a similarity and I think of like how the kittens like, whatever is moving around him he's like oh, what he like wants to look at it you know and he he immediately will look at it and go for it <laughs> yeah that's will. definitely true for for humans in a way so as a parent and i want to keep this focused on parenting although there's so many ways to apply this as a parent i want you the listener to consider this solution that as parents, we accept this challenge, accept a challenge and ask the question, how can we make valuable activities interesting and available to our kids? Hmm. Because oftentimes, uh, we already said this, but when you see a kid doing an activity a lot of times we come down on the kid mm -hmm. as if it's like a will thing or as if it's like a character thing. But not only do I not think it's a will or character thing, I actually don't think that's helpful at all. It doesn't really like own the role and responsibility that I think we can take as parents, like the pleasure that we have to own that and to actually proactively do something positive about it. So the second we start to ask this question, which I'm not saying is easy, but I'm just saying I think it's the right direction, is to say, okay, I got a challenge now. And if you have a married couple or a couple at all, uh, it's even better because you have like a team. Mm -hmm. We have a challenge ahead of us. Um, how can we make the things that we think are valuable how can we make them interesting to our kid and available to our children? Mm -hmm. And that's a tough thing to do. Yeah. But the conclusion, you guys probably already see where this is going. And this is what I wrote about in this book about what happened to our week. Because what happened in our week is with the coronavirus, our addictions to social media just became exacerbated as... Mm -hmm the times were changing and there is this impending feeling like I needed to stay connected online to know about what's going on in the world mm -hmm. that was changing so rapidly. So if I'm on social media one hour a day, now it's two hours a day. Yeah. And, and it's impossible to stop because just like the pink elephant, when we say don't think about social media, don't think about coronavirus. What are you thinking about? Don't think about your phone. Yeah. You can't turn it off. Mm -hmm. The only thing that we found that we're able to use to become free of these addictions is a higher or better purpose, which for us became this new schedule. And for me, writing this book that I talk about in uh, the this book itself. And it actually became such an enjoyable thing. There was a hard starting point. Like it took this, um, you know, momentum, like to get rid of the negative inertia, like just sitting there. It took yeah. momentum. But once I found myself going, I found myself really enjoying the process of writing mm -hmm. to a point where I started to forget to check social media. Mm -hmm. And that's when I feel like you've really won. Mm -hmm. not when you shame a kid to get off the computer to spend five minutes doing math. No. Like what if we could actually get our kids to choose the things that are valuable for them, mm -hmm. but 
it might not be things you already naturally have in their life or around the house. Yeah. So that's what I want to talk about real quick um, is three solutions that we found. And I'm going to read from page 33 of Unleash Your Family, my book. And this, um, it's just a paragraph. In fact, you want to read it? Sure. Well, it has this this line I scratched out, so I have to read my own writing. Maybe I'll mm-hmm. do it. Instead of spending energy forcing our kids to do things, what if we spent our energy making the event so beneficial and helpful for our kids that it's irresistible? Our kids are smarter than we think, and they want what's best for them too. What a privilege to have some ideas that we can share and then partner with them on the same goal. So there's a couple things here. Um, But the idea is, as a parent, we have like a limited amount of energy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we spend our energy forcing our kids to do things, which takes up a ton of energy. Yeah. And the thing about it is, it's going to take up a ton of energy the next day too and the day after that and the day after that because it never goes away. Mm -hmm. When you're forcing kids against their will, when you're coercing or manipulating or whatever, it's hard work, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if we can invest into things that help them to change their mindsets and their habits themselves by them concluding that things are interesting Mm -hmm. and they're available so that they start to choose them, I think we have a huge win. So what happens if a kid chooses an activity that's interesting to them, um, but the parent, it's not like video games, but let's say it's like drawing, but the parent, they're like, I want to draw. I don't want to do math. But the parent, especially in our society, you're like, but math you need math. You don't need drawing. What should you do then uh, as a parent? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked, Cammie. <laughs> I think the number one thing that we can do to inspire our kids towards being interested in activities is to model it ourselves. Now, what you're asking brings up an interesting question. What if math's not interesting or useful for you? Yeah, but yeah, but then you have all these things that tell you, well, I don't want my kid to be stupid or they need to know basic stuff. Otherwise, they're not going to get a good job. I mean, there's just there's just these like tapes yeah, yeah, that yeah. play. No, on I know. And I I minds. think it's tough because there are like there is a strong case to be made why you should force kids to jump through hoops to get good grades in school so that they can like succeed in that system. Yeah. But I do think there is a question to ask if you can't model why this thing is helpful to you in your life, what business do you have forcing a child to do it? Mm. I mean, I didn't want to go there with this podcast, but but I actually think that is where I mean, a lot of people would be like, "That's all. That's all nice, but math. You need math, you know." But that's interesting because, like, Do what you? if? Well, I know. Like, so what if, like, you could think, well, I could model, like, taking that question seriously. Say, well, I needed algebra, but I didn't need anything past algebra, so I'm not going to make my kid, you know. Unless they want to go past algebra. I'm going to like, Like, I'm going to post a video that I watched this guy called boy and band, boy and band or whatever. He made this video about school and he talks about how he graduated knowing the Pythagorean theorem, but he didn't know how interest mortgages or the stock market worked, Mm -hmm. you know, and how frustrated he is by that. And that's a common frustration, but I don't know. You know, it's like, I don't want to get into that too much because like that one, honestly, you guys out there, you're on your own for that. Cause I, I can't tell you how to force kids to do that because I personally don't think those things are valuable, Yeah. but, but I do want to focus on the things there's, let's just draw a Venn diagram. There's things you think are valuable. 
There's well, things that your kids you think say, are valuable. There's got to be some overlap. Yeah, yeah. You could say, um, like, maybe maybe you're a parent out there that's like, well, my kid's still going to do math. They still have to do math, which most parents are going to say that. Well, maybe you could say, okay, they're, they're going to do math, but I'm also going to figure out what they're interested in and give just as much time to that, if not more time than this math that they're not interested in. And you might even find that they get more interested in math just if they're able to do more what they're naturally interested in, perhaps. So there's that. So once again, we're back on what you can do and we're under modeling it. I think another way to model this is, well, let's talk about something very universal like exercise okay Mm -hmm. i think it's beneficial for kids to exercise i also think if i can't model exercise being interesting yeah to my children why in the world would they ever conclude that it could be interesting to themselves right now by the way you'll notice i slipped a word in there of modeling modeling it being interesting not just modeling exercise Mm -hmm. i think a lot of people model exercise but they model hating it because they do exercise that they hate then they're like why don't you exercise to their kids and you're like well you just showed them how much it sucks you know so yeah they hate it are you surprised at that so like Mm -hmm. you know part of the trick is to it's a reforming a reformatting of how we think about activities ourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is like a nether optimal way of thinking. I don't think a lot of people are familiar with because we're so we're told at a very early age, like you just, you're going to hate everything. You're going to hate school, but you still do it. And mm-hmm. it's going to get you a job that you hate, but you still do that. Mm-hmm. And that's going to get you someday into retirement that you might hate, but you're, and you're just going to do that. Or maybe retirement's the only good thing, but you do, you do what you hate to get into something else that you're going to hate to get into something else that you're going to hate to get into something you love. And I don't think that needs to be the case. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we're better off focusing on the things that we love and assuming that there's things that we love that are actually also valuable and productive. Yeah. Things like creating art, creating music, um, studying and learning, following curiosities, mm-hmm. selling shit, um, starting businesses. Mm-hmm making products that make people happy, um, exercising, all of these things, I think there's ways to find enjoyment in them. And there's also ways to, to hate them and just Mm -hmm. use them as a means to an end. Right. Okay. That first thing though, once again, is to model it so that our kids see that. And when our kids see us having a good time doing cool things, Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but it, it almost, we have the opposite problem around here where we have to like say no, like, our four-year-old wants to help out in the kitchen all the time, way more than we want him to. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is also true about us running and running marathons. We just started running, and we enjoyed it, and our kids begged us to join us. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, the second thing is to invest in it. So not only does it have to be interesting, but it has to be available. And when I say invest, I mean our time, our energy, our vision. And this is a very unique time with this pandemic because people are spending more time at home than ever. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times in our history, we were used to investing or having other people invest into our kids and other environments were kind of like the more the primary environment, whether it's the school or the church or the club or the sports team. And now a lot of times our homes, which receive the least amount of attention and investment, Mm -hmm. like are kind of shown for how important they really were the whole time. Yeah. Um, so the, one of the things I thought about today was memory today said that she wanted to um, do pottery mm-hmm. and all the pottery places are closed. I think she's actually good at it. We've already paid for her to go to lessons and go to this place. And I told her right away, like, find out what you need to buy. Mm-hmm. And I would love to buy it for her. And then I found out like a fucking wheel cost two grand. 
But I actually still think it's probably worth it because if it's something that she's interested in doing, I would rather her do pottery than watch Netflix. Mm -hmm. But she will not do it unless there's a pottery wheel wheel here or unless she has access to one. And if you don't have just two grand, there's probably more creative creative ways to find to get that like having the kid raise their own money or you'll match whatever they raise or that kind of thing i mean that literally i think is the most expensive example of anything we've i know bought that i've heard of in I my was entire just thinking, life like a lot of people are like <laughs> okay yeah i don't have two thousand dollars lying around but okay but yeah it can be uh, other things that don't cost so i want to talk really quickly about a few areas in our house that we've invested in well first of all just investing in your house period and treating your home and saying this is just as important as making a workspace productive or a home office or a, sorry not a home office but an office making a home you want to be in and you it makes it allows creativity to flow yes from your kids yeah creating environments that inspire and interest your kids that's the challenge here remember Mm -hmm. so once again if your kids are playing video games it's because they think it's the most interesting and available thing so instead of blaming them to say what what kind of environments can i create in my home that inspire and interest them Mm -hmm. i think another solution which is i think pretty easy is like an art station you know find out i mean we talked about pottery that's a form of art but there's a lot of cheaper easier ones whether it's a table with markers and crayons and glue um and projects you know i mean you can go on amazon and buy spend twenty dollars and can go a long way Mm -hmm. um like watercolor sets i think are like 99 cents on amazon Mm. (laughs) um But it takes some thought ahead of time. Yeah. And, you know, I'll I'll just give one other example. But we have like a gym downstairs that gets used all the time now by our kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, Me and Seven use it every morning. Dove and Eden seem to use it four or five days a week. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. But if it wasn't there, they wouldn't use it. And they would probably be doing something else. And we'd look at them and blame them for not doing it but we had to be the ones that spent the 550 dollars to go out and buy the equipment Mm -hmm. ahead of time yeah right okay the final thing um as a parent after we model it after we invest into it i think is to let go Mm -hmm. um and to trust the process and i found this true of myself you know when I wrote this book, one of the days I wrote about was I had kind of like a relapse where we set this um, goal of doing these hour long work blocks. And I, and one of my rules for myself was to not go on social media for that mm-hmm. full hour. Yeah. And during that hour, I was like mindlessly surfing for like 15 minutes I wasted. Mm-hmm. And I would have tended to like beat myself up about that. Or if you see a kid, you know, like Mm -hmm. you buy the art station for the kid and the kid's on it. And the next day they're back to playing video games. He's going to want to come down on them. Be like, I built you the damn art station. (laughs) Get off the fucking video games, you know. Um, But it doesn't work that way, I don't think, always. And one of the best things for me to do was to spend that 15 minutes surfing Mm -hmm. and then to, on my own volition, choose to go back to writing yeah you have to kind of like dabble and experiment a little bit and be like man video games are so cool or surfing the internet is so cool and then you do it and you're like actually it's okay yeah but i really also like creating art you know i think we have to like let our kids get bored of it sometimes and ourselves yeah and let let that process happen and just create the environments continue to invest in the environment yeah and model it yourself and just trust mm. that it'll happen. Yeah. Build the environments and they will come. But it's really hard to let go. It, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You probably will just feel like, yeah, this was all for nothing and they'll never be off the video games or whatever. But But if you believe that kids will do what is interesting and available to them, 
people get bored of everything. Yeah. You know, and and they say like there's this these studies called like well, it's that documentary called Rat Park where they showed that um, one of the best ways to get rats unaddicted to, um, to drugs mm-hmm. was to change the environment. It was oh. just to give them better alternatives and things yeah. to do. Mm-hmm. And the dr- the rats that were the most addicted were the ones that were in the worst environments. Um, and they would go back and do the drugs a lot. And yeah. a lot of times we look at society, we look at the people that do drugs and we're like, what an idiot. Like... I don't do drugs. You shouldn't do drugs. Yeah. And we have no idea what environment they came from. Oh, yeah. And no sympathy. I even just think, um, I'm really thankful that we live in a house. But I do think that living in houses and not like closer to nature, it does affect us. Like it makes, our, it's like a bleaker environment. I mean, it is warmer. And nicer and I you know you kind of have to have some kind of shelter but I think to be cut off from nature the way that we are is I think it pays a much higher toll than we even realize is that your way of trying to get me on another through hike (laughs) well no but I'm down (laughs) all right what do you guys think about that those ideas um we will have a discussion about this. We have a um, fight for together Facebook page that the link is in the description and I'll post the discussion over there. Um, I'd love to hear you guys' thoughts and more than any specific idea, I would just love for parents to stop blaming their kids and start accepting this as a challenge for themselves because all the blaming it, takes up an incredible amount of energy and it just doesn't lend itself towards long-term solutions yeah and instead of fighting our kids if we can use our resources and energy to actually i mean it sounds so cheesy but to make the world a better place to make our world a better place Mm -hmm. what better thing is our money good for and our time yeah so I would just love to see parents start to tackle that question um, instead of asking, how can I get kids off the video games? Mm-hmm. Because I think that's a losing battle in our experience. All right, guys, um, all of these ideas that we talked about are present in this book. It's called Unleash Your Family, Chaos of Creativity in One Week. It goes through our process. Oh, I had this whole card I was going to read. It was an advertisement, but I forgot it. Um, it goes through our process of how we transformed our family in literally one week by doing this. It is 100 pages long and takes less than one hour to read. And it's available on Amazon as an ebook. It's available as a PDF on our own website. And it's available as a paperback. And I'm working on getting it out as an audiobook, so you can check if that's available yet. Um, but I would love it if you're interested in these ideas, if you would check that out, if you want to learn more and it covers a whole lot of other things also. Yeah. All right. Well, this podcast is available on iTunes and Spotify and Google play and anchor and all sorts of places. And as a video on YouTube, if you want to watch that in the future, Uh, You can subscribe to see more of them. Thank you guys for listening. We'll see you next time. Peace. Thank you for listening to Fight for Together. We'll see you next time. Oh my gosh, I'm tired. Whoa.